wherever we go, whatever we do, we leave behind data. When we talk on the phone, when we go shopping, when we commute to work. Many governments want to use our data to boost efficiency. But where do we draw the line? When does data collection go too far and we risk living under a full-blown surveillance state? Big data analytics, a blessing or curse? That's our topic on Shift. Honestly, I can't imagine my life without the internet and my smartphone. Digitalization is all around us and makes our lives easier in so many ways. But it's a double-edged sword. Our data can also be used to monitor us to a degree never seen before. The result is a world where anyone can be a target. This example out of Hyderabad, India shows just how fast that can happen. This is Indian activist SQ Masood. He lives in one of the most highly surveilled cities in the world. In 2021, he was stopped in the streets of Hyderabad by the police. And they asked me to remove my face mark. So I asked why. They, they have not given any explanation and they said, uh, just remove your mask. The police took a photo of his face, but they wouldn't tell him what it would be used for. This uh, issue was triggering me. Where they will use my photograph, with uh, whom they will uh, share these photographs. This is a class issue. They can't do this exercise in the posh areas. The educated and elite people can question them, but the poor people, due to fear, they can't resist. Masood wrote to the police, but was met with a wall of silence. Since then, he's been raising awareness of the potential dangers posed by facial recognition technology. I believe they are building database of people taking photographs. This is about the misusing of powers of the state. Masood filed a petition in court. He wants to know how his data is being used. Masood fears the state is systematically collecting data without the proper safeguards, and data privacy experts confirm his suspicions. Our police has digitized every aspect of policing. They are building databases and making profiles of everyone in the city. This excessive policing is very targeted or at specific places where marginalized communities live, people from poor or people from low caste backgrounds or Muslims. When authorities abuse their power, it's often poorer people who suffer. Activists worldwide are fighting for institutions to respect the fundamental rights of all people, including in digital spaces. In India, the Internet Freedom Foundation is one group at the forefront. The thing with all of these police departments is um, that there is a lack of transparency as to their actions. So we don't really know um, what they're doing. We know for a fact that they're stopping people and taking photos. We know for a fact that they have a lot of CCTV cameras. It's an obvious next step to think that it is being used. It's a known fact that India's government is building a centralized facial recognition database. There are also databases in specific sectors, including education and healthcare. One of the biggest concerns of Indian civil society right now is that a lot of these databases will be interconnected and that will result in 360 degree surveillance in India. That could be problematic because they would conflate purposes for which the specific data was collected and used uh, initially. Once personal data has been collected, it has to be collected with a purpose in mind and it has to be minimized in such a way that only the data necessary to achieve that purpose is collected. Data protection measures are crucial to safeguarding our privacy. But protecting our private life is becoming a more daunting task. After all, the more data can be interlinked, the more valuable it is. That's the principle behind big data. To understand the power of big data, it helps to visualize the data you create day in and day out as a satellite image. Each individual data point represents a single pixel, essentially useless on its own. Only together do they reveal a bigger picture. Just like satellite images show that storms are forming, your online search history will reveal who your friends are or which political views you hold. 
Technology also allows us to comb through data and spot things that would otherwise have remained secret. For example, companies can know women are pregnant before they even tell their families by seeing that they buy products like pregnancy vitamins or calcium supplements. On a larger scale, big data can help governments anticipate and meet our needs as a society. For instance, by predicting birth rates, they can plan for how many teachers will be needed in the future. That's why more and more governments are tapping into the pools of data that they have about their citizens in sectors from healthcare to education. And that's why they're eager to collect more and more of it. India has greatly invested in its digital future. In 2000, just 5.5 million people in India had internet access. That number is now more than 800 million. To govern the evolving digital space, lawmakers are proposing the Digital India Act 2023. The aim is to regulate artificial intelligence, machine learning and other technologies, like 5G and cryptocurrencies. A look into the smart city of Hyderabad shows just how crucial it is to have such rules in place. Hyderabad is considered one of the most surveilled cities in the world. As a smart city, we are probably would be, I would say, comparable to Delhi better than most other cities. On a scale of say 10, I would say we're probably at three or four right now. While the city is way ahead of many other cities, we still have long ways to go. Smart cities is a big focus area for us as a country. A technology solutions that can help cities with improve the quality of life. Researchers here analyze data, for example, to predict mosquito infestations or to better understand how rooftop coatings can help cool down buildings, or to forecast when the air is cleanest so that people with respiratory diseases can plan when they go outside. We work on water, environment, pollution, uh, transport, uh, health, and uh, safety. And when it comes to safety, surveillance cameras play a key role. Like this city has about 35,000 cameras on the roads. Today, that system is being used to monitor remotely or to investigate a crime. And something has happened, they go back and see what happened. The researcher says those same cameras can also be used to automatically detect suspicious behavior and alert police that something's wrong. This beautiful, powerful technology resource is not being used to prevent crime. It can be used, and now they're talking about it. But how can we trust that governments are striking the right balance between harnessing the power of this data and ensuring people's privacy is protected? So it's a little bit of a challenge. Uh, it is a little bit of a challenge. But then, like, see, this data belongs to the government. It's with the police. I would not be worried so much about this data. See, at the end of the day, if you can't trust the government to keep your data safe, who else can you trust? Governments actually pose a great risk to the rights of individuals if they do not apply um, safeguards and principles. Digitalization and data protection should go hand in hand. This small European country is setting an example, Estonia. We are trying to become what people call a digital republic. The model that we are following is something that has been implemented in Estonia. Estonia the small nation on the northeastern edge of the European Union experienced several difficult years after regaining independence in the early 1990s. But then it embraced a digital transformation like few others. Since the beginning of 2000s, uh, there has been a steady progress and, and um, approach to uh, build and digitalize uh, not just the government, but the whole society. Today, citizens can do almost everything online, from renewing their passports, to voting in elections. And now you can also apply for getting married online. Well, you have to uh, show up to actually say the commitments, but uh, the application itself can be done now also digitally. But data protection rules in Estonia are very different from those in India. In case of Estonia, because the European Union already has a data protection law in place, uh, they, they follow it, they adhere to it. And there are a little safeguards. In India, we don't have them. But there are only a few regions, shown in black on this map, where data is protected by regulations as rigid as those in the EU. We have data protection laws adopted or updated in 
virtually all of the jurisdictions of the world. But then the situation on the ground is very different. That's why the Digital Personal Data Protection Bill is crucial for India. These topics have long been discussed, like how to prevent data breaches or how to ensure only authorized parties are accessing people's data. Experts are concerned about exemptions supposedly meant to serve national security purposes. But there's wide consensus that a law is necessary. The Supreme Court said that the right to privacy follows from the fundamental right to life in the Indian Constitution. However, since then, there has been no law which would actually effectuate the right. So there is currently no data protection law in India. There is no saying how the government is collecting and processing and the data that they're collecting from the citizens. That's why SQ Masood has decided to fight back. He's demanding his data be deleted. I'm trying to protect my privacy. And there are a lot of people who can't uh, come out and question. So I want to take their advisors to the state. Masood wants to set the precedent for better data protection in India. Masood's case is important to push back. It's very important to tell the police that not everything is going to be treated OK, whatever they are doing. Activists say the authorities are building a massive surveillance apparatus. That building is the new command and control center for Hyderabad police. This is where you will, they will have access to all the CCTV cameras in the city. Any data that people are collecting, the police are collecting on the street, are stored. It makes me very, uh, I mean, it makes the entire scenario dystopic for me, okay? It's as if, to me, I live in a science fiction movie where the state has got too much power and it's constantly after you. Digitalization can mean both progress and surveillance. What's your take? Are we living in some sci-fi dystopia or is our private data secure? Let us know what you think. See you next time.